We have been studying about the person of God as a part of our study of theology proper or the study of God the Father. We have been studying about the person or the personality of God. And we have seen many attributes of this personality of God. We have seen that the attributes of God can be divided into two parts the incommunicable or the natural attributes of God and the communicable or the moral attributes of God. And in the moral attributes of God, we have seen attributes like the holiness of God. And now we are looking at the righteousness of God. Last week, we had begun studying about the righteousness of God, that God is a righteous God. And we have also seen that the righteousness of God is connected to the justice of God. They both go together, the righteousness and the justice of God. God is not only righteous, but he is just. Now we have also seen that the righteousness and justice of God are manifestations of his holiness. The holiness of God is revealed to mankind in his justice and in his righteousness. In other words, when God deals with mankind in righteousness and justice, in that we see the holiness of God revealed to mankind. We have also seen that the scriptures very clearly state that God is righteous and just in all his dealings with mankind. God is so righteous and so just, we have seen, that he even gives an opportunity to, to lost mankind to judge him at the great white throne judgment. We have seen various verses connected to this subject and we have seen how unsaved men and women would, just, would judge God and try to show that God is unjust and try to justify themselves before God. But they will fail to do so. Now the reason why God allows them to judge him is because he is just and they really believe that they might actually find a cause to justify themselves, but they would fail miserably and would be cast into the eternal lake of fire because God's judgment is righteous and true. And this is going to happen at the great white throne judgment because mankind has rejected God's offer of love in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. They would have absolutely no grounds to stand before God. They would never be able to justify themselves. They would never be able to find fault with God because God is righteous, God is true, and God is just. Therefore, he will triumph when he is judged by lost mankind. But today we are going to look at how the righteousness and justice of God are revealed to mankind. They are revealed mainly in two ways. Firstly, God's justice is seen as retributive justice. And I will explain this in a minute. It is seen as retributive justice. Secondly, it is seen as remunerative justice. What we mean by retributive is that God punishes the wicked. And that's very clearly seen in the Bible. So the retributive justice of God is seen in his punishment of the wicked. The punishment of the wicked and the remunerative justice of God is seen in God's rewards for the righteous. So this is for the wicked and this is for the righteous. And the retributive and the remunerative justice of God are revealed to mankind in these two ways in the punishment of the wicked and in the rewards or, or the rewarding of the righteous look at Psalm 11 we will read verses 4 through 7 the Lord is in his holy temple the Lord's throne is in heaven his eyes behold his eyelids try the children of men the Lord trieth the righteous but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. The Bible very clearly teaches that God not only hates sin, but he also hates sinners and the wicked. It says, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. God is going to punish the wicked. God is going to... Uh, to 
punish them and show the world that he is righteous and just. It may look like the righteous are flourish, the, the wicked are flourishing today. It may look like God has turned a blind eye to all the evil deeds of the wicked people of this world. But don't be fooled for a moment. God has not shut his eyes. God uh, uh, is not ignorant of what is happening in this world. God knows everything and he's keeping an account of every wicked deed, every wicked thought. Every wicked sin that is being committed in this world. And he will judge the world in righteousness one day. And the Bible says that upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone. You see because God is righteous he has already given the world an opportunity to, to be redeemed. Because God is just and because God is holy, because God is love, he sent his only begotten son Jesus Christ into the world to die on the cross for the sins of all mankind, to shed his blood for the forgiveness and redemption of mankind. But when man rejects God's offer of love in uh, the person of his son Jesus Christ who died for our sins, who was buried and rose up again, then God will judge such people who reject his offer of love. God offers his love in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. But when the wicked of this world reject that offer of love, God judges them in righteousness and in justice. And the end of such people will be in the eternal lake of fire. Now Psalm 11 was written by David. It is like David is saying, Saul is reigning today. Wickedness is flourishing today, but there will come a time when God will establish his righteousness and uh, God will punish the wicked. Well, we can also say that even in this world, God will punish the wicked. And uh, ultimately also God is going to punish the wicked and cast them into the lake of fire. There is such a thing as the wrath of God. Christians, when you witness to the lost, don't talk to them only about the love of God, but talk to them about the holiness of God. Tell them about the righteousness and justice of God. Tell them about the wrath of God which is abiding upon them for rejecting Jesus Christ, for being outside of Jesus Christ. You need to present a balanced gospel. Yes, you need to preach about the death, resurrection, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, but never forget to also talk about God's justice, God's righteousness, God's judgment, the hell that awaits every wicked sinner who rejects the offer of God's love in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible makes it very clear that God's retributive justice is seen in the punishment of the wicked. Look at Exodus chapter 9 and we will read uh, a few portions from verses 23 to 27. We will just pick out a few words. Now I'm not trying to, uh, to quote any words out of context. We'll still keep it in context. And here we have the account of the plague of hail. And this, these are the words of Pharaoh after the plague of hail. And Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and I and my people are wicked. This lost sinner acknowledges that God is righteous. Why does he say that? He says that because God judged Pharaoh and his people. So Pharaoh is saying, God punished us for our sins and in doing so, he is righteous. Do you see how God's justice is revealed? How God's righteousness is revealed in his punishment of the wicked? So that not only the righteous can see it, but even the wicked themselves sometimes can see that this judgment has come from God. Like Pharaoh says here, I and my people have sinned and God is righteous. Pharaoh acknowledges the perfect justice of God in punishing him for his sin and rebellion. Pharaoh also knew that he deserved it. Pharaoh knew that very clearly. He, he deserved this punishment of God. But you see, those who uh, call themselves atheists or the critics of the Bible sometimes point out this incident and, uh, incident and say, God is unjust in his treatment of Pharaoh. How could God do this to Pharaoh? But you see, Pharaoh himself acknowledged that he deserved that punishment. And that punishment was due him because of his sin and rebellion and because God is just and righteous. Not only unsaved people, but even God's people acknowledge that in the Bible. Look at Daniel chapter 9. We'll read verses 12 through 14. 
And he hath confirmed his words which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as had been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore had the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. You see, God's retributive justice is seen not only in his punishment of sinners, but it is also seen in his chastisement of his own children. Daniel, in his great prayer in chapter 9 of his book, acknowledges this. He says, we have been punished by God because of our sin and rebellion against him, because we have disobeyed the law of Moses. We have broken the covenant that God made with us. That's why God punished us. And in this, he says, we see that God is righteous. God's righteousness is seen in his punishment of the wicked as well as in his chastisement of his own children. Look at Revelation chapter 16. We'll read verses 5 and 6. Revelation 16, 5 and 6. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Look at that. God's righteousness in verse 5 is associated with his meeting out punishment to the wicked. God punishes the wicked because he is righteous. And it says here they have uh, desired blood, so God gave them blood to drink. God punished them because they deserved it. It says they are worthy of that punishment. And because of this, the angel says, you are righteous, O Lord. So God's retributive justice shows us the righteousness of God. That's the first thing that we learn about the righteousness and justice of God. But the second thing is the remunerative uh, justice of God in which we see that he rewards the righteous and there are a few ways in which he does it and we're going to look at that. Firstly, we see that the remunerative uh, justice of God is seen in the forgiveness of the sins of his own children. Look at 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, a verse that you might be very familiar with. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a very familiar verse uh, that we all know. It says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. You see, the justice of God there is connected with uh, the forgiveness of sins. He's re he rewards his children by forgiveness. So, the remunerative justice of God is seen firstly in his forgiveness of the sins of his people. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just. That faithfulness is connected to his righteousness. And then he is also just to forgive us our sins. Now, there are many preachers and many Christians who believe that because our sins were dealt with on the cross of Calvary, the, the moment we were born again, our sins were forgiven. So there is absolutely no need for us to confess our sins today on a day-to-day -day basis to God. Now, you cannot be more wrong about this. When your sins were judged and cleansed at Calvary, that was for your salvation. Because Jesus Christ has taken your sins upon himself on the cross and shed his blood to cleanse you from all your sins, was buried and rose up again, you are going to heaven because you trusted him uh, as your savior. And you have believed that he has done all that for you. So you're going to heaven because of that. But if you want to have fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ on a day-to-day -day basis, you must confess your sins on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, your sins are forgiven, but you see, when you actually sin in the present time, your fellowship with Jesus Christ is broken. And in order to maintain that, you must confess your sins as a born-again Christian on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, ordinarily, the forgiveness of sin is connected to the mercy and the love of God. 
We talk about the compassion of God when he forgives uh, his children for their sins. But we do not connect uh, the forgiveness of sins with righteousness and justice. But in the words that we have seen, he is faithful and just. In other words, he is righteous and just. And that's why he forgives the sins of his people. Christians, you must remember this. As born-again Christians, you have a right to come before the, the, the throne of grace through the blood of Jesus Christ even today. And you can ask God to forgive you for the sins you have committed on a day-to-day -day basis. And God is more than willing to forgive you. You know why? Because Jesus Christ is your advocate with the Father. He is and his blood is the propitiation for our sins. And because of Jesus Christ, we have a standing before God and we are accepted in the Beloved. Many Christians, when they sin, feel so guilty that they have uh, no courage to go back to God in prayer and confess their sins. They think God is angry with them, God will not receive them, and they go farther and farther away from God and backslide and fall into a life of sin once again. And that is very sad. That's what the devil wants you to do. But God wants you to come to him every day and confess your sins to him and know for a fact that God will forgive and receive you and restore that broken relationship because of his son Jesus Christ. When you go to God and confess your sins, your confidence should not be in your confession. Your confidence should not be in yourself. But your confidence should be in Jesus Christ, your advocate with the Father. And when you go to God, you receive forgiveness of sins because God is righteous and God is just. He will forgive you and restore your fellowship with him. Not only do we see God's righteousness and justice in uh, the forgiveness of our sins, but we also see it in God keeping his word and his promise to his children. This is seen in God keeping his promises and his word to his children. Look at Nehemiah chapter 9. We'll read verses 7 and 8. Thou art the Lord, the God who didst choose Abram and made us a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites to his seed and has performed thy words for thou art righteous. Now once again you see the word righteous being associated with God keeping his promise to Abraham. And it's the same thing with you and me in this church age. We need to just recall the tremendous obstacles that were in the path of this promise being fulfilled. Abram left his uh, land and he came to the promised land without knowing where he was going. God called him, he obeyed and he came and God said, I'm going to give this land to you and to your descendants. But after that, Abraham's descendants went into captivity into the land of Egypt for more than 300 years. And then when they came out, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And it looked like God's promise would never be fulfilled. But God kept his promise. He gave the promised land to the children of Israel. Even today, it looks like God's promise has failed. Because for 2,000 years, the children of Israel did not live in their own land. But we know that in 1948, they once again were gathered back to their homeland and Israel became a nation again. And God's promise to Abraham will be ultimately fulfilled in the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. God keeps his promises because he's righteous and that gives great confidence to the Christian. Christian, God has given us great and precious promises in this book. And these promises are vouchsafed to us because of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God will keep his promises to you and to me in Christ. Like you know that all his promises are yea and amen in Jesus Christ. So God will never go back on his word. God said it and he will do it because he is righteous. We can trust God to keep his promises. Now the third thing that we see is that God's righteousness and justice are revealed to us not only in forgiving our sins but in, and, and in keeping his promises to us, but also in his vindication, in his vindication of his people. 
in the vindication of his people. Look at uh, Psalm 129 and we will read verses 1 to 4. Psalm 129, 1 to 4. Again, I will abbreviate uh, these verses and read a part of this passage. Many a time have they afflicted me, yet they have not prevailed against me. The Lord is righteous. He hath cut asunder the cords of the wicked. Now, sooner or later, God's people will triumph gloriously. In this life, we may suffer, but there is coming a time when God will bring justice to us. And God will help us, his children, to triumph, just as David triumphed over Saul in the Old Testament. Even in this life, God will give us rest from our enemies. Remember that. It doesn't mean uh, when we suffer or when we are persecuted by people, God turns a blind eye to it. No. He looks at it. He, he makes note of it. And there are times when, if it is his will and if it is according to his purpose, he delivers his people from the hands of their enemies. God is righteous. He vindicates his people. He can do it here on this earth. But if he doesn't do it here, he will do it later in the life that comes after. Many Christians think that, oh, if God is going to do it, then what will it matter to me? God should vindicate me now. Christians don't realize that that life which is to come is more real than this physical life that we are living. And that's where we need God to vindicate us. And that's where we will see that God is for us and he will judge our enemies for persecuting us unjustly. There, that is the place that we look forward to be where the wicked cease to trouble us. And we will be at peace and rest forever and ever. And that is because God is righteous. We also see the righteousness and justice of God revealed in his rewards to the righteous. In the rewards that he gives to the righteous. Look at Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed towards his name, in that ye have ministered unto the saints and do minister. You see that God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. He will reward you because he is righteous and he is just. He will reward you for your labor of love. Don't ever get discouraged. You continue doing what God has called you to do. It may look like there is no fruit. It may look like you're not doing anything good, but with all the hard work that you're doing, you keep doing what God has called you to do. Sometimes you feel very sad because people don't appreciate you. Sometimes you feel sad because people criticize you and try to destroy you for the good work or the labor of love that you're doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says very clearly that we should not be discouraged, but keep on doing what God has called us to do. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll read verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Keep doing what God has called you to do. Give of your best to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not worry about the results. Do not worry about the criticisms. Do not worry about the lack of appreciation for all your efforts. You do what God has called you to do. You obey God. You implicitly trust him to reward you when, his, when your time comes to get the reward. It may be here on earth or it may not be here on earth, but you can rest assured when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, your labor of love will be rewarded. He says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, that's all you need to believe, that your labor is not in vain. You may not see the fruit with your eyes like Jeremiah. Jeremiah preached, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. He had hardly a few converts and uh, he was very discouraged too. But now when you look back, you can see the tremendous impact that Jeremiah had on Israel, on Daniel in particular and his friends. So you may not be able to see the fruit of your labors now, but God knows it. God sees it. God makes a note of it and he will reward you for all your labor. 
Keep doing what God has called you to do, even though you may not find any appreciation for what you're doing. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Once again, you see the righteousness of God connected to the rewards that he will give his children. Paul says, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, and not only for me, but all, to all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and his appearing. And who will give that reward? The crown of righteousness, the Lord who is the righteous judge. The righteousness of God is connected to his rewards or to, or to the rewards that he will give to those who are faithful to him. He will not allow the faithful believer to go unrewarded. Here we are not always rewarded. Remember that. There are times when we labor uh, very unselfishly without any ulterior motive just to please the Lord and to, uh, and to serve him faithfully. What do we get back in return? Nothing sometimes. That's how it looks. But God will not let your labor go in vain. He will reward you because he's righteous, because he's just. It would go against his nature and his character to uh, leave you unrewarded for all your faithful work for the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, work hard. We don't have much time left. You say, what can I do? Well, you can witness. You can tell somebody about Jesus Christ. You can pass out a tract. You can write a letter or an, or an email or send a message and give them the gospel of the grace of God. You say, well, I've tried that. I've become very discouraged because nobody is getting saved. You don't worry about the results. You give the gospel. You go out and you tell people the way they can be saved by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Give them the gospel according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 4. Give them the whole picture that God wants them to have. Tell them everything that they need to know to be saved. Whether they get saved or not, leave it into the hands of God. You don't worry about the results. You don't worry about the fruit. Leave it into God's hands. You be faithful. There is not much time left. We need to tell as many people as possible that Jesus died for their sins. He was buried and rose up again. That he has shed his blood for the forgiveness of their sins. And if they but trust him for their salvation, they will be saved and will be given eternal life. Their sins will be forgiven. They will live forever with Jesus Christ in eternity. We must be... Uh, constantly laboring to put out the gospel. When I see so many young people wasting their time, it really saddens me. These young people that I'm talking about are born again Christians, but they don't do anything to witness to their friends or relatives. They are very busy with their studies or they are very busy pursuing uh, worldly pleasures. And that's very sad. You don't have much time. The Lord is coming very, very soon. And also remember, it is your youth that you can give to God as uh, your gift and give the best years of your life to serve God. Now, I'm not saying that you stop your studies. I'm not saying that, you know, you give up your jobs. I'm not saying that. Wherever God has placed you, be a faithful witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you are going to school or a college, you're working somewhere. Give your time to Jesus Christ to tell somebody uh, about him. And that's the best you can do. Like that old hymn says, give off your best to the master. Give off the best of your youth. Clad in salvation's full armor, join in the battle for truth. Such a beautiful way of putting it. Young people, God wants you to go out there and tell people about Jesus Christ. If you are saved. And God will reward you one day because he's righteous and just. Even if nobody gets saved. You don't worry about that. You be faithful by putting out the gospel of the grace of God. But I want to say this to those of you who have never trusted Jesus Christ as your savior. If you have watched this Bible study so far, you have seen that God is righteous and just, that God will punish the wicked one day and God will reward the righteous. That's because God himself is righteous and just. Now, God is righteous and unless you are as righteous as God, you can never hope to be saved and you can never hope to go to heaven. 
You say, I'm a good person. I don't do anything wrong. I don't kill. I don't commit adultery. I don't murder. I don't steal. I don't lie. Well, the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You are a sinner. You have been uh, conceived and brought forth in sin into this world. You have that sin nature inside of you because of which you commit sins. Even if you have committed one single sin in your life, you will still go to hell. You would have lied, you would have done so many other things. If you have committed one single sin in your life, you will go to hell. That's because you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned. Every single person in this world has sinned against God. So all your good works amount to nothing before God. The Bible says they are as filthy rags before God. Your righteousness is as filthy rags before God. Your good works will not get you any grounds to stand on before God. Nor will your education, nor will all the other things that you think will help you to gain eternal life. You say, I'm a very religious person. Your religion cannot save you. You say, I've done everything my church has asked me to do. I'm baptized. I take the Lord's table unless you're born again by faith in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. All these things cannot save you. Jesus said, Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's how righteous you need to be and still you will not enter into it because you're a sinner. And your righteousness will never be enough to take you to heaven. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing and all our, un uh, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. If you want to be righteous before God, you need to receive the righteousness of God and that righteousness of God is a person and he is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You need to trust him for your salvation. The Bible says in Romans 3, 22 to 26, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now the summary of all this is this. That if you believe that you are a sinner who deserves nothing but hell, but if you want to be saved, you come to God by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. You must believe that Jesus died for your sins, that he shed his blood to wash you from your sins, that he took your punishment, he paid the penalty for your sins. He died, he was buried and he rose up again. If you trust that he has done this for you personally, you will be saved. God will justify you and God will declare you to be righteous. He will say, though your sins are as scarlet, you are justified. You are righteous in my eyes because you have the righteousness of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's an exchange that takes place. You give your sins to Jesus Christ and he gives you his righteousness. And you stand before God as a justified person or as a saved person person and God looks at you as he would look at his own son Jesus Christ. My prayer is that you would trust Jesus Christ as your savior right now and do not delay anymore. So this is what the Bible talks about in brief on this great subject of the righteousness and justice of God. The righteousness and justice of God are revealed to mankind in the way God punishes the wicked and in the way God rewards the righteous. God bless you.